Hey everybody, it's Romania Black, and we're on episode 15 of Seraph of the End, technically episode 3 of Core 2 or Season 2, but these first two episodes, this second season has hit the ground running. It has been crazy. I, there's, it's just like this world, they're like, okay, we set it up, we set you up with the characters, with the world building, here's the lore, now let's just complicate things for two episodes running and make it go absolutely crazy. And I'm like, what is happening? I'm here for it, but it's so insane. Like there's been so much happen in the last two episodes. I'm kind of floored by it, but yeah, I, Okay, so I wasn't going to record this episode this soon, but I got home from work and I was like, I really want to watch Seraph of the End. <laughs> so, and so I had another show I was going to watch tonight, but I'm like, I'm just going to put it on the back burner, have my cup of decaf coffee because it's like nine o'clock at night. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to enjoy my Seraph of the End episode. And here we are. So yeah, we're on episode three of season two. Episode 15, I'm really excited by it. Um, setting up the old Farid. Farid's being, you know, a diva with that Zoom call last episode. <laughs> Just stirring shit. And Cruel's not happy about it. And meanwhile, uh, Yu has enlisted the help of Gurren and the others. And they've been training with their... We got their special Bonkai abilities in the last episode. Their special abilities. It reminded me a lot of Bleach. It was very Bleach-like. Especially with Kimizuki and the coffin. That reminded me a lot of Bleach. <laughs> But, um, but they got their special abilities now. And I like that Shinoa establishes that little mystery of, you know, it's kind of rare that these guys instantly have special abilities. We usually work for that. And it's like, huh. So, little sketchy, right? Just a wee bit. But um, I'm very curious now. It seemed like Shinoa, and we found out Shinoa and Mitsuba tried to find some info about Kimizuki and you and Yoichi's pasts. And there's nothing. So I'm like, okay. So the sister of Kimizuki having the curse, having the, the virus, is much more suspect now because I'm like, we know that you was from that orphanage and was possibly from some experimentation that that sect of Japan was doing. But with Kimizuki and Yoichi, I'm like, do they have some like shady past that we don't know about? Is there something else going on behind the scenes? I, I don't know. But I'm very curious, so I don't know y'all, but it's episode 15 and I'm I'm really excited. So I let's not waste any more time, shall we? <laughs> We're gonna start Seraph of the End. Season two, episode three, or as I'm gonna put it on Patreon YouTube, episode 15. And we're gonna start that here in three, two, one, and let's go. What is this show? <laughs> I, I, man, this show, every episode, it makes like the alliances and the trustworthiness of each character more and more sketch. Like I was, I was ready to throw Gurren onto the fire two episodes ago. And now with this episode, I'm like, I, is Gurren that bad? I'm like, is Gurren the traitor? I don't, I don't know. This show makes you question everything. It makes you question who's loyal to who. And the Haragis are just awful people. With the exception of Shinoa, and we'll talk about Shinoa in this episode, but the, the main Haragi family, they're just the worst. Especially Kureto. I was like, oh, Kureto. Kureto doesn't strike me as, I don't think Kureto's the traitor in all this. No. Kureto is, he's just like lawful evil. <laughs> like Kureto is just not nice. He's not a good character, but he's not slimy. Kureto is not a sneaky character. He's just bad and he knows it and he's totally okay with it. He has his ambitions, the ambition in the demon army, the name of this episode, and he's totally fine with it. And it's like, okay, he's just completely chill with the fact that he's just going to take over the world. Okay, I it's very refreshing to see a, a villain, uh, the um, the leader of this group, be antagonistic and just be so confident about it. It's like okay, sure, but Gurren, Gurren is still sketchy to me. But now this is the funny thing. It's like is Gurren sketchy because I think Gurren's sketchiness to me is the fact that he's using you. He knows what this like angel or something inside of him, this seraph thing is possibly, um, and he's comfortable with using you even if it hurts him or others around him. That's the part of Gurren that I don't like. But now, whatever Gurren's motivations are, that's the interesting part, because we don't really know. We get a little bit into it, maybe, and we get Gurren's weakness, which is not what I expected at all. I'm like, oh, Gurren's emotional. Interesting. He, he loves his comrades and friends. Interesting. Okay. All right. But I've got this episode silenced, and I want to go back through it. But so, so 
Coretto has been having these carrier pigeons sneak messages inside and outside of the fold, like back and forth to the fold. The, they've been going back and forth. And the vampires don't care about the birds, clearly. They're not, they don't consider the birds a threat, so they don't even notice the carrier pigeon uh, carrying stuff back to the girl. The girl with the sideways ponytail, the ponytail of death, the girl there that has all the pigeons, the, the keeper of the birds. Interesting. So Kratos whole thing is he wants to rule the world. Neat. And it's been, I, we're going to talk about this conversation he has with Gurren because it's fascinating in that we get, there's not really any, I mean, with the exception of, I think, Shinoa's squad, <laughs> all these other characters have kind of like bad ulterior motives. And it's like, who can you trust? And in this series, it gets more and more, it gets interesting because I'm like, is she, is the girl with the ponytail, is she the traitor? Did she alter the message that she gave to Credo? We don't know. So she gave this message to Credo. She could have altered it before she got to him. She could have changed the meaning of it. We don't know. This girl ain't said two words this entire series. She could be the traitor. It could be her instead of Gurren and Shinya. Interesting. Interesting indeed. But yeah, so I, Gurren and Cruel. I, I once compared Gurren and Farad together, which, okay. I guess you could compare Cruel and Credo. But I feel like um, I feel almost like Cruel and Gurren are more similar in this than just Farad. That's interesting. Hmm. Something's a muck. But uh, let's go back here. So we get we cut back in here to uh, old poor used cowlick. <laughs> I was saying in the reaction, my cousin he's like seventeen. So he's about the same age as these characters. And he had a cowlick just like this the other day. And he's like, I can't fix it. And like, he even tried to get it wet and it, nothing worked. It's like, it's, it's just hopeless at this point. But I like subverting gender norms. We think that Mitsuba and uh, Shino are going to be cooks. No. These two winches, they can't cook an omelet. I just, I kind of love it. I sort of ship Shino and Mitsuba together. So the idea of them failing at breakfast, I'm like, all right, girls, keep doing your thing. Mm-hmm. But I also love how Kimizuki, Kimizuki is the doer of all things. He is our jack of all trades. He's had to take care of his sister this whole time. So he's had to know how to cook. He's had to know how to clean. He has to know how to drive a car. Like Kimizuki is our expert. He's like our big brother. Kimizuki is the big brother. He's the tallest of the group and he is the big brother. He's the one that can do everything. And I love his excuses. It's because you all can't. <laughs> right? So that smoke kind of looks like the smoke coming off of that girl at the end of the episode. I, we don't know who she is. I mean, obviously, it's just a, a parallel, but I also love that Shinoa has the pink apron and Mitsuba has the blue apron. They have little color-coded aprons. It's adorable. Mm -hmm. Very, very cute. And they're both, like, looking at Kimizuki making the omelet, like, oh, so that's how you do it. <laughs> I'm like, where did, where did Mitsuba get the idea to put alcohol into a skillet? Like, girl, no. <laughs> that's not how you do it. Why would you do that? Um, but yeah, what a spread. I love it. And so I like that this wholesome, like, friendship brunch, this, like, friend brunching, I love that the whole purpose of it is to, like, okay, we gathered everybody here. Now, are we going to betray our, you know, supervisor? <laughs> are we going to, are we going to betray our, our superior? And the, basically, Shinoa's like, we need to talk about two things. One, you need to get, become privy to the fact that he's been experimented on and messed with. And two, are we going to keep with Gurren or are we going to betray him? I like that we have that conversation and I like that you kind of makes the decision for the group at the end. He's like, no, I'm, you guys do what you want, but I'm going to stick with Gurren. And, and as soon as they brought this up, I was like, well, you is not going to leave Gurren because Gurren has already told him he's going to help reunite him with Mika. And it's like, that's, you know, that you is not going to leave the opportunity and the possibility to get reunited. I feel like that's where I think Gurren and Cruel are similar in this episode because both of them kind of make like deals with the devils. Like Gurren's like, you, I will help you get back to Mika if you help me do this. And Cruel, whatever she told Mika, she's made a deal with Mika. She's like, I want you back. I didn't even know she was interested in you until this episode. Like she has not seemed interested in you at all. Farad's been the one that seemed interested, but she's interested now in you knowing that he's an experiment. Because she saw that footage that Farad showed in the Zoom meeting. So she knows that, that you is an experiment that was left over. So now she wants him as well. So it, it's just like just like how helping Gurren will benefit you to get back to Mika, you, Mika helping Cruel is going to benefit him getting back to you. So they're just kind of doing it out of convenience, right? 
So we get to this scene with the vampires. I'm sorry. <laughs> this scene, this series has made a habit of showing just how bad both sides are. Because yeah, the vampires using humans for livestock to drink their blood. That's awful. That's bad. I don't think any of us agree with that. But Farrah just chaining, or not Farrah, but Coretto just chaining these vampires in these like little scant dishcloth clothes up to this giant scythe and letting them sit there digging in the dirt, going crazy from lack of blood. It's, it's not good. And I wonder, I'm like, is that a weapon or is that literally just a scythe? Is that a weapon that's his or is it just a scythe that's there for decoration? Because it looks kind of like Shanoa's, right? And then these, the vampires are so out of it, all they say is blood. There's blood. And they just like reach to try to eat after him because they're just famished. Like they're starving. And, oh my gosh. And he's like, you're sick. And it's just Kureto sitting there. Kureto Haragi. Yeah, I kind of see why maybe Shinoa doesn't hang out with her family. <laughs> Shinoa's like, I don't want to hang out with these weirdos. My family's weird. I don't like them. Hmm. This this is a very complicated relationship because you have you have Gurren who his sword houses the spirit of a relative of Credo's sister cousin whatever that was in love with him that became a demon that he killed. So Gurren is very trep a trepidatious relationship with his family. And he's like, God, why am I so say well? And it makes more sense now why Gurren is so like stark and blunt with Shinoa. Plus Shinoa looks kind of like her sister. And so Gurren's like, that's awkward. So, you know, he kind of feels weird about that. But yeah, the fact that Coretta was just sitting there watching these vampires starve to death. And he's like, it's an experiment for the cursed gears. I thought it'd be more efficient way to turn vampires into demons. Why are we wanting to turn vampires into Four Horsemen of John? Why are we wanting to do these things? I, mm, to get the cursed gear. Mm -mm. No sign of that at all. Low level trash won't do. And he tells Gurren to kill him. I'm like, ugh. So apparently just any old vampire can't just become a four horseman of John. Okay. And then he asks if Gurren came by himself and he's like, well, you ordered me to. Sure. And so they have this conversation and, and Credo's like, you know, were you afraid I'd kill you? And he's like, why would you kill me? And then if you, then you'd have killed me sooner. You won't kill me while I'm of use to you. So clearly uh, Gurren and Credo have a past. I'm sure it's tied to the sister. Um, that is now Gurren's sword. And so, yeah, Kur Gurren's like, you need me. So as long as you need me, you're not going to hurt me. So I'm pretty safe. Like, he he seems very adamant about that, like calling his bluff, right? And Coretto has the sniper sit there and kill the vampires. And just shoot them. And he's like, yep, I'm not going to kill you. Yeah, Coretto's very pragmatic. He doesn't strike me as slimy or sneaky. He's just very blunt. And so he asks Gurren outright, he's like, okay, these three kids that you got, who are they? Yeah, who are they? How did you create three black demon prospects? And we get a little bit of world building here. And Gurren's like, we were lucky. I like that that's his excuse. He's like, we were lucky. And I'm like, that's, that's a terrible answer. <laughs> and Coretta's like, that's impossible. All black demon prospects are test subjects of human experiments. So we're establishing that Yoichi and, Shim and Kimizuki are test experiments. They're subjects of human experimentation. When did this happen? What? Explain. But we don't get that. It's just, it's just casually noted. And then Credo says that on top of that, most of them fail and the success rate is very low. So it, it is suspicious. It is suspicious that Gurren just happened to stumble across three individuals all around the same age, around the same location, that just happened to be successful in using an art and practice that is usually unsuccessful and involves a specific type of human experimentation. Total coincidence, could happen to anybody. <laughs> I do think that, that is suspect. Like, I don't blame Credo for asking him, like, really? It just by luck happened? Okay, sure, Jan. Um, but Coretto doesn't seem bothered by it because he's like, I'm more than happy to have more black demon users. So fine. If that's what it takes, if you have good trial results, share them with me. Like, and then Gurren's like, if I feel like it, is that all you wanted? Like just the contempt, like just the contempt between these two, like these two guys that sit with their hands in their pockets, just like, is that all you wanted? Like just coming out here. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm leaving. Bye. 
And that's when Coretto's like, now hold on, wait a minute. Why did you suddenly act black, add black demon users to your pawns? Are you planning a coup? And Gurren's like, if that was my plan, I would have killed you right now. Like, why would I wait? And Coretto's like, you wouldn't be able to. And they like, he's like, you want to have a go? And so clearly these two have been at odds before, right? They've been at odds before. Now, whether it was over Shinova's sister or whatever, we don't know. But they, they've been at each other's throats before. It's weird because Gurren's design looks a lot like Hughes. And standing here looking at Credo with the smug look on his face, he kind of has like a, a Kimizuki vibe, like with his hair all spiky. Interesting. And he's like, oh, you're doing a good job. Don't get fired up. I'm just giving you, I'm just razzing you because you're suspicious. And then Gurren's like, okay. He says, but I also know your weakness. Love, friendship, emotions that you should, that you know should be shut off. So he's suggesting that Gurren is very emotional and has like way too much love and emotion and friendship towards his comrades. And I'm like, Gurren's like usually the opposite of that. So that's interesting. And he's like, but you can't do that. Hmm, that's why I can't trust. That's why, exactly why I can trust you, Gurren. You'll never become a threat to me because you can't betray your comrades. He's like, you're tied down to your friends and your squad. So your, your love for them, your compassion, that's your weakness. Like, you'll never turn against me because that'll put them in danger. So they're a liability to you, is what Credo is suggesting. And then Gurren's like, oh, you just like holding people hostages, huh? So is that how we're doing this? What do you want me to say? And then Credo just basically circles around him and he asks him what he think will happen in the future and he's like what's the point in living in a world like this and he's like I'm sure people ask that question and then Gurren's like I did not come here for a philosophical debate <laughs> right Gurren's hard to read I feel a little bad for Gurren in this conversation because he's like what do you want from me but he's still it's odd this episode makes Gurren seem less suspicious but that in itself could be a red herring. Maybe we're meant to think that. I And maybe what Gurren's doing is not wrong, but it's suspicious because we don't know the full context of the situation yet. He's like, I want to hear what kind of vision you have. He's like, you continue building up military power in a world with no hopes or dreams. And Gurren's like, he's like, what's your intention? And Gurren's like, we need more power because we're in a world like this, right? So Gurren, Coretto's like, why are you building up military power? This world's like gone. Like, there's no point in it. Why? Are, what are you doing? What's your point? And Gurren's like, because we need to survive? <laughs> Gurren's like, why else would we build up military, military power in this world except to survive in these situations? And he's like, well, of course. But one is better dead than alive without a vision. So... To Coretto, it's not enough that you're just surviving. Like, survival is not enough. You need to go beyond that. What's your ambition, right? Ambition in the demon army. What is your ambition post-vampire? Post like, PV, what's your ambition? And if you don't have ambition and you don't have a vision, then you're better off dead. Because, you know, what's the point of living if there's nothing to live for, right? People who sacrifice others without a desire are evil, and he's like, evil? So that's interesting. So Credo's like, it's okay to sacrifice people. It's okay if people die as long as they're meeting the desire of someone else, as long as there's a reason behind it. That's a dangerous line of thinking, saying that the sacrifices are worth it for, for the ambition of the better, you know, the better ambition. Sacrifices are totally fine. And Gurren's kind of like throwing it in a face like, are you, you sure you want to go with that logic, huh? And then... Credo says, I'm going to recover the world. And Gurren just has this little pouty badger face. He's like, really? Yeah, I'm going to recover the world. Since the vampires broke down the communication network, we can't communicate abroad. But there has to be other human organizations that survived. So that's an interesting bit of worldview. We have like the two, the two ravens, the two crows that are sitting here listening to this conversation. That, that's an interesting bit of worldview, of world building. Not worldview, world building. In that we've established that Japan has kind of cut off communication from the rest of the world. The vampires took down the communication, so the rest of the world is shut off. So we don't know if there are other anti-vampire associations. We don't know how that works. I get the idea that there are vampires across the world, because in that conference call in the last episode, the one the one CL looking vampire, uh, Les Carr, was saying that he that he or she or they wanted to take over Japan. Maybe 
putting into them frame that he or she or they was not in Japan. So interesting, interesting. But Credo Gurren's like says your goal to recover the network, right? To start communicating with everyone. And Credo's like, no. That this is the thing. Like, you would think based on how he started this conversation, that you'd be like, okay, Credo wants to get rid of the vampires so he can get the network back up and running and communicate to the rest of the world and talk to them and help them out. No! He wants to exterminate the vampires from this country. And do that first and then crush the remaining human ex organizations. He's like, I want to find out if there's any other organizations on Earth and crush them. He's like, I want to rule the world. The Haragi family wants to rule the world. And, and I like that Gurren's like, that sounds like a kid's dream. That sounds like something out of a five-year-old's comic book. That doesn't seem realistic. And Credo's like, oh, it does sound cool, doesn't it? But he's like, as a first step, I'm going to kill all the vampire nobles. And saying that there's 25 in Japan. He's like, do you stand a chance? And so I like that the sun is out while it's raining. Usually that's a sign. My, my mother and grandmother always said that if it's raining while there's sunshine, it's going to rain the next day at the exact same time. That's like the old, the old wives tale. Um, so that's interesting. And the shadow of him. So he establishes that they know the location of the 25 nobles that are in Japan, which I'm assuming has been learned from that kid sending messages back and forth to Ponytail Girl, to the lady keeper of the birds. And then and Curran's like, well, you're getting really ambitious and greedy here. And he's like, oh, do you think the rug's gonna get pulled out from under me? He says, it's possible the intel itself is a trap. And he's like, I've already considered it, but I don't have time to muddle around. He's like, yeah, it could be a trap, but we're gonna roll with what info we got. And so then, and then Gurren says, why are you in such a hurry? And he says, in a month, the vampire's main unit will attack Tokyo. And in that case, if that happens, if we're a step behind, humanity will end in an instant. But if we move now, we can surprise them. So I'm like, you want us, you want to get rid of the vampires and everything. You make this excuse that, oh, humanity's doomed if, if we don't act quickly against the vampires. But I'm like, you're going to wipe out all the other world's organizations anyway. <laughs> I guess it's just to protect Japan. Kareto's main goal is to protect Japan. And it, it's no use ruling a country if there's no citizens, right? What's the use of ruling over a population if there's no population? So that's interesting. But yeah, he tells Gurren this. He's like, Gurren, take your squad and a hundred of the Moon Demon Company guys and head to Nagoya. And it's like, okay, head to Nagoya. But then he says, he's like, there's a base with 10 nobles. So out of 25, there's 10, which is almost half kill them all and take over the base i'm like no big deal just kill 10 of the 25 nobles in all of japan should be a breeze <laughs> like what i like what i'm like they barely if crowley's a noble and farad's a noble they could barely handle two two you want them to go kill 10 okay assuming a lot and then gurren's like if they do we'll, they'll find out our plan and he's like, it'll be enough if we can distract the enemy's eyes. So we'll prepare for the final battle. So yeah, and Gurren's like, so we're disposable, huh? He's like, so you guys are making all these preparations. Credo's preparing for something, some grand thing. He's like, well, we're getting all the master plan stuff out of the way. You guys are going to go attack these 10 nobles and distract them. And then hopefully by the time we get done, you guys will still be alive. Is essentially what he's doing. And he says he'd only entrust this mission to someone that he could completely trust. And if you can do this, we can take it from there. Hmm. And so Gurren's like, so you won't tell me your true plan, huh? You just tell me this, this overarching goal, but you're not going to tell me your actual plan. And he's like, trust my ass. And so it's this, it's this weird cat and mouse game, right? Because it's like Credo does not trust Gurren, but he needs Gurren. And he wants to use Gurren. So he just tells Gurren enough to satisfy and entice him. And Gurren's like, well, trust my ass. If you if you really trusted me, you'd tell me the whole plan. But he's not going to do that. And then Credo gives him the letter. He doesn't answer that question. He doesn't answer. He just gives him the directive. And I want to make note, Gurren hesitates. He goes to reach for it and he goes, okay. Like, he hesitated. He hesitated to take the directive. Mm, 
interesting. Interesting. And then Credo says to shut up and follow my orders. If you do, I'll show you a world where we turn vampires into livestock. So again, it's just both worlds. When he, both worlds doing the exact same thing. The vampires turning humans into livestock. The humans turning vampires into livestock. It's the same damn thing. We're just doing the same thing to each other, right? And I thought that, I think that was an interesting little contrast in that you had Credo telling Gurren, he's like, shut up and listen to me and listen to my orders. And then you had Gurren a few episodes ago telling you to do the same thing. Like it's a nice little call back there. But God, I love this. I love how... I love that Gurren's like, he holds the sword and that's when the spirit where she, she says, no, Gurren, you're supposed to follow my orders. Uh, do we see her ears? Like she has the red eyes and little teeth. If you do, I'll make your wish come true. And he says, shut up. And then he takes the hand off the sword. Ha! Ah. So Gurren being emotional, a secret softy, just like you, maybe. But what is his wish? What is his wish and how can his sword help him accomplish that? Hmm. Interesting. And I, you know what? Shinoa may be onto something when she said that Gurren's being controlled by her sister and Gurren's like, oh no, I'm in control. I'm like, are you? I guess you are at the moment. Hmm. So yeah, so we cut from that to a, uh, meanwhile, we have the scene of you and Shinoa on the balcony. And so you is looking off to the west to where he thinks that Mika is. And here's the thing I noticed about Shinoa in this scene where she's all bubbly and, and quirky. Um, and you is feeling bad because he's like, I almost killed you, didn't I? Isn't that bad? And she tries to brush it off. Here's the thing about Shinoa. I like Shinoa's char character a lot. I can see how someone would be very annoyed with Shinoa. I can instantly see that because Shinoa's character, she has this defense mechanism where her defense mechanism is I put on a bubbly front and I'm always happy and I'm always really nice. And I have this, I have this, uh, it's like toxic positivity, right? She has this toxic positivity where I always have a smile on my face. Everything is great. Everything is fine. But in reality, she doesn't feel like that. In reality, Shinoa very much feels not in command all the time and she is emotional and she does get sad and worried for her comrades but she puts on a smile so that they don't get worried for her and i gather the impression based on her the rest of her family which are a real treat i can definitely see why she would put on that front because they're she's like if you don't joke with them and, and do this then they're just a bunch of pricks and it's like mm -hmm. so i like that i think if you can understand that about her character it makes her a lot more tolerable and it does for me i like her character a lot but you can definitely notice that it's all just an act. Like the whole happy sunshine stuff is an act. And she has these brief moments where you see the real Shinoa and it's like, mm, okay. But then I love that she calls Kimizuki and you her knights. The knights of the Shinoba squad. I Would that make, I guess that would make, would Yoichi be a bishop maybe? Yoichi and Mitsubo would be bishops perhaps? Hmm? But yeah, please protect me with your life. And he's like, ugh. I, I just, I like that scene a lot. And so I like that she doesn't lie to you either. You was like, did Gurren plan on me take, losing control? And she's like, probably. She doesn't lie. She, she doesn't beat around the bush. And he's like, no. He's like, I know what. He's like, I know what I'm going to do. I know my answer. And he says, when we raid the vampires, would you come with me? And he, he says, you know, in case if I lose control again, I want you to be with me. And she's like, that's not going to happen. I like, she's like, you don't have to worry. I love that. It's very okay. sweet. And then he says, then please take my hand. And it's a pain to go far, but I guess it can't be helped. I love that. I love that he takes her hand. It's so sweet. It's, it's very cute. It's, I don't know. I don't view it romantically. And she's just like, has a little blushy face. I don't view it as a romantic thing. I just view it as like, he, he counts on her and he, he admires her. And he says he's going to stick with Gurren because that's a way of saving Mika. And I, I like that. She's going to touch base on that with Gurren here in a minute. But I like that I like that you keeps his conviction. He's like, you guys are my family and I love you and I want us to stay together. But I also have Mika. He's important to me. I need to find him. And he's like, 
I can't forget about him either. It's like, it's like you was like, I, I, I want this new family, but I have to remember my old ones too. And I'm glad, I'm glad that he doesn't abandon Mika in all of this. He's like, maybe I don't know what the concept of a family is. And the funny thing is, he says, does a family betray just because they were betrayed first? Like, do we just keep the cycle going, right? And I like the idea that you doesn't think he knows what family is, but he kind of does, you know? And I think that's funny because we don't see Shinoa's reaction. Shinoa has a big blood family, but their concept of family is quite different than this, I feel. And I feel like Shinoa maybe is like, oh no, you, your concept of family is a lot greater than these giant families and their concept as well. And I like the Kimizuki. He's like, it's fine. We're all a family. We got this. And then, yeah, you says that Gurren said he'd lend me a hand with Mika, so I'm going to trust his word. There's a lot of talk about trust in this episode. Gurren being like, why do you trust me, Credo? Does Gurren trust Credo? Does Credo really trust Gurren? Who do they both, you know, who's playing who? You's like, can I trust, you know, my feelings? Do you trust me? And then he apologized for getting involved in something so personal. And Kimizuki, I love that he breaks it up. And he's like, nah, your concept of family and mine is the same. We don't agree on a lot of things, Bakayu, but in terms of family, we do. And I'm like, and then everybody else, it's the same thing. I'm like, yes, please. Yes, please. It's so cute. It's absolutely adorable. I kind of love it. Mm -hmm. And then she does the little, the little toast thing with the cup. And then we see the birds. And we see the birds. And we see the kitchen and the stairway. It's interesting. I don't know why we cut to those random shots there. I don't know why we shot to those random shots unless it was in the manga and they just adapted it to this. But that's interesting. And so then, yeah, Shinoa says, I would have never thought we'd go with such a tactic in a world like this. Because, yeah, she's grown up, like, with the same thoughts as, as Credo that the world's just awful. And that it's, you know, deserves to either be ruled over or, you know, the strong is going to survive, so let's just take it over. And so, you know, Shinoa kind of grew up with people around her with that same mindset, but... She says, we're going to defend and fight. We're going to defend family and fight. And everybody's like, oh, they give you hell about his bedhead. But it's like, it's so sweet. And every time we have like a nice moment of family and warmth and comfort with you, we cut to Mika suffering, <laughs> right? We cut to Mika suffering. And, and his walk, his little, I will, give, I will give Mika this. He does not have the diva walk that Farrah does, but he does kind of have a little bit of it when he's in a hurry. But he's needing that blood of cruel. And she was actually, she was actually making it for him. Like you see that she was giving him blood like she expected him to come. And she's like, oh, Mika, you're here. And he just is like, I need, and, and, and he looks so desperate. Like that look in his eyes. And she's like, oh, like you see her like going, and she didn't cut her wrist. She cut her palm. And he, she was like, I was just getting you. And he doesn't, he just like immediately goes to her. Mm hmm. And she's like, oh, were you that thirsty? And she's like, there, there. It's like, ugh. And then, and then he pushes her away. Like, he gets he gets that moment there, and he's like, ugh. Mm -hmm. And he says he's sorry, but he was, she's like, everyone gets like that without enough blood. And he says, could I get a little more stock today? So he's like, I need some more to take with me. And you could tell he's gotten taller. I feel like Mika's gotten taller because he's much taller than her now. Like he's still aging, right? And she's like, I'll give you as much as you want. And I love that she like wipes it off his face. Like she's like, but you won't last forever with just my blood. Mm, she's like, it's not going to be enough. That day will come for sure when you can't wait that long. Uh-huh. And so she says she's going to get him, like, the stock ready and tells him to go wait. I honestly, for a split second, thought he'd, like, get desperate and, like, lick the blood off the carpet. But, no, that's not going to happen. And then he asks what we've been thinking of since the last episode. Were you actually going to kill you and me? And she's like, and, and so I like that she says, oh, that's rare. Are you worried about me? You know, like, are you worried that I'm going to get in trouble since I spared you and you and you? Hmm? And he just wants to know. He's like, Why? Why did you let us live when it puts you at risk? And, and she whispers to him. And she's like, what are you trying to do with us? And she's like, that's something you don't need to know. She just comes out and says it. She's like, you don't need to know that. It's not any of your business. And he's like, 
He's like, and his thing is if you're planning on using you. And that's so funny because Mika's whole thing or Yu's whole thing was you told Gurren. He's like, if it helps me get to Mika, then use me. He was all for it if it got him to Mika. And Mika's like, don't use you. And it's like, <laughs> it's great. It's great. And he goes, he goes to punch her, but she just goes, Nick. I freaking love her voice actress when she says, then what would you do? The way that she said that, oh, that was so good. Her voice actress is amazing. I love Cruel's voice actress. I need to look up and see what else she's been in. She's fantastic. She's like cutesy, but then there's like this like poisoned honey quality to her where she's like cutesy, but there's power. And it's, it's very rare. I've not seen a lot of series other than like a straight up like Sailor Moon series where the really cutesy character is freaking strong and a threat and has the upper hand in the situation. You don't normally see that in, in series. And she's just like, nah, I'm a queen deal. And it's just, and she's so cute about it. I'm like, yes, please. And she's just like, I thought she was going to break his wrist. And she's like, you're just my pet. And he says, I can't stay with you anymore. And it's like, well, wow, you say that, but you need my blood to survive, huh? And she's like, I'm not as bad as humans because I like you and you. So it's like, hmm. I'm like, why do you like you? And he's like, I don't believe that. And she's like, believe it. So she tells him, she's like, I, and he shakes his head like, mm. but, but she says she likes him and you. She's like, I'll tell you why I kept you two alive. And we don't get to hear it. Why I need the Seraph of the End. Hmm. And then she tells him. Now, whether it's true or not, we don't know. But she gives him a reason and she says, we're going to start a war in a month. And this time we'll send up the main unit and kill every human in Japan. Now, I'm like, why? Why are we killing every human? Don't you need them to survive? Don't you need human blood to survive? Why are we doing that? <laughs> why, why are we doing this? What? Why are you killing all the humans? It'll be the great war between vampire and humans. So Mika, you'll hide from both humans and vampires to recover you. So she's sending him on a mission to get you. You is apparently important. She's like, you'll need to hide from the humans and vampires to recover him. You're going on a reconnaissance mission. This is a secret mission. If you fail, the whole world will turn on you. Okay. And he suddenly has this resolve. He's like, fine, I'll save you from both humans and vampires. But I'm like, he was going to want to stay with his friends. So it's going to get angsty and complicated. Damn it. You're just, it's the same thing with Farron. Damn it. Again, we see, con we see connections between Cruel and Gurren. Except Gurren has the whole map. With, I'm curious, he has the, like, strategy map here when um, Shinoa comes to visit him. And he's moving all the pieces across the map there. And she tells him about everything that's happened. And he's like, okay, cool. I want to see what was on this map, if we saw anything more with that. And Shinoa says, you've asked me if I fell for you last time. And he's like, I don't recall anything like that. It's like, yes, you did. It's like, you bitch. You did so. And she says, I don't know either, but for the first time in my life, someone needs me. And I plan on measuring up to it. So I like that with Shinoa. Shinoa's like, it's not that I like you romantically, but he needs me. He wants to rely on me. And Shinoa's like, no one has ever needed me before. And that's such a, that's such a sad thing, but such a cool character building moment for her. And that she's like my whole life, because she's from the Haragi family. They're the leaders of the demon army. They've got all. They've got anything they could want. They have. So why would they need anything from Shinoa? She's the baby sister and everything. She's the the lowest end of the ladder, the lowest rung. And so for her to feel needed by someone, that's a big for her. That's a big impact. And so I could see why it would affect her. Mm. I love that. I love that. Um, I love that Gurren this whole time is just. Gurren's like just circled by Hiragi's. Hiragi's just circle him the entire episode and he's like, leave me alone. So we have on the board, we have a bunch of people in blue in Nagoya City and then we have reds. And then he shoves the greens up next to it. So it's like, hmm. Like, what does each represent? 
And so he says, I have a mission for you. Come to the staging base tomorrow at 0600. Hmm. And he leaves with a little note. We're going to kill the vampires in Nagoya. Okay. Okay. And then Mika, like, comes walking in with his, like, reconnaissance suit on, like, ready to go find you. Okay. And then we get these other two vampires, the ones that killed Yoichi's sister. I was told we're first moving the main unit to Nagoya and then hit Tokyo. So, of course, I, there, there's people behind the scenes working the strings, right? Working the strings. Because why? They took a detour to Shibuya last time or whatnot. And then that's where everything went down. And now, instead of going to the main thing in Tokyo, they're taking a detour to Nagoya where everything's being set up at. So... Somebody is pulling the strings and organizing this whole thing. It's, ugh. And I like that Mika is talking to the other vampires, but it's still just like, I'm just trying to get to you. And then we have this experimentation. So we see a girl or whatever that has like reddish brown hair, right? Doesn't, doesn't Kimizuki, see, and we don't see her face. We deliberately don't see her face. And Kareto's watching this. I'm like, we deliberately don't see who this is, but it's, it's, is it Kimizuki's sister? Cause yeah, the girl. Ugh. There's a reason we've not seen this person's face. It, I thought, is it Kimizuki's sister? I'm gonna need to go look them up. Gonna need to go look them up because yeah, what? And then there's all that black smoke and stuff coming out. So, and they're like, it could kill them. But what? So I want to go back real quick to the sister and see her back in the last episode. I've got this pulled up on the Blu-ray. I want to see this like and see what she looks like. Uh, it's just, uh, no, she has the same color hair. She has the same color hair. And she has the whole thing with the, I'm like, is this, is it, she has the same color hair. Is it Kimizuki's sister they're experimenting on? If they've been experimenting on, on Kimizuki and his sister, and that's why she has the virus and stuff, is that his sister they're experimenting on for this? If Kimizuki finds out, I just, that look like her. Oh. Hmm. 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 Right? Oh my God. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this episode, so, so many questions about who's deceiving who, who can you trust, what's going on. We're going to Nagoya. Something's amiss. Cruel has let Mika know something that's important, or so we think. And she wants you to be saved too for reasons that I feel like Gurren are, are going to come out in the wash. And Kuretto is just the worst. And I like Shinoa. I like her resolve. I like you being a cinnamon bun. There's lots of stuff going on in this episode. And now I'm really curious to know what we're going to do next in episode 16. But we'll get to it eventually, won't we? So I'm very curious to know your thoughts down below. This was a really good episode, but lots of questions, lots of things being set up as per usual with this series. So in the meantime, I hope y'all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care. And yeah, I'll be back next week with episode 16 of Seraph of the End. Bye.